In this episode of the Spire Sessions, we talk about the role of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for Companies. It will be a two-part session. In this first part, Spire CEO Leon Pereira and sustainability consultant Nitesh Dulab will dive into what these goals are and what they mean for businesses around the world. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest edition of Spire Sessions. My name is Leon Pereira. I'm the CEO and founder of the Spire Research and Consulting Group. We are delighted to have with us today Mr. Nitesh Dulab, who's our guest and who's going to talk to us about the role of UN Sustainable Development Goals for companies uh, in this day and age. And that's something that Nitesh is very familiar with. He's going to share a little bit of, our ex of, of his experience, you know, working in this space. Uh, Nitesh has served as a diplomat for the South African Foreign Service. He's currently based in the U.S. Uh, as an independent consultant. So, uh, Nitesh, welcome to Spire Sessions. Thanks, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Leon. Hi. So, Nitesh, uh, first of all, perhaps I can ask you to share with us a little bit about your, your background and what drew you into this whole space of corporate social responsibility and sustainable development goals and, you know, the intersection between that and, you know, the corporate sector. Great. Leon, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, thank you to you and the team for giving me the opportunity to, to share some of my thoughts on uh, sustainability, but more importantly, around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So, Leon, for me personally, my journey with sustainability actually started when I was part of Nelson Mandela's government when he was, when he was in power. Uh, or when he was released from prison in 1994. And, you know, it was, it was a time of real change in South Africa at that particular time. And I joined his government uh, in 1995, whereby we started looking at the economic reconstruction and development of the country. So I was part of his trade and industry team. And the idea was to look at very core sustainability issues from an economic perspective, but more importantly, from a social perspective. So for me, you know, sustainability has carried me since the early years when I was part of Nelson Mandela's government, you know, and, and as part of that particular portfolio, we looked at areas on export promotion, but more importantly, looked at sustainable investment into the country as part of foreign direct investment. You know, and we were very successful in landing some huge multi-million dollar projects in South Africa. For example, uh, I would refer Heineken. You know, Heineken was one of my, my leading projects that I worked on. And, you know, it was a team effort in the sense that, you know, we worked with a variety of government departments, with a variety of public sector and private sector uh, institutions in bringing uh, Heineken to South Africa, but more importantly, also increasing jobs. That was our number one target. And, you know, another, another important one would be also Ferrero Roche, for example, you know, the chocolate guys. If anybody likes chocolate, you know, that's, that's the number one player that we brought to South Africa as well. So, so personally for me, um, sustainability has, uh, has been very close to my heart since I started with uh, uh, looking at social and economic uh, investment projects. But my journey has taken me um, through a variety of different paths. You know, I moved from the Department of Trade and Industry and then moved to China as a South African diplomat. And there we also looked at foreign direct investment, but also investment promotion in a sense of assisting South African companies to do business in, in China. Right, right. right. Also uh, bringing in new foreign direct investment into uh, into South Africa as well, you know, and all of this had a very strong social and economic sustainability element to it. So maybe just to answer your question shortly, you know, that's where my journey actually started. That's interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think we have some parallels in the sense that I started my career with the Singapore Economic Development Board, which uh, is involved, you know, in some of these types of activities too, you know, attracting foreign direct investment, you know, promoting. Uh, com locally based companies and their investments abroad. And I think it's interesting you talked about, you know, Heineken and Frere Rocher. I mean, we all uh, love to consume their products. Correct. But it's also underlining the fact that 
these goals are not the enemy of the private sector or business. And you know, you 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 have an intersection there that can potentially be realized where you know you create value and innovation and jobs, you know, through private sector activity, but that activity is really not in a particular direction to be kind to the planet, to respect your ethical, social goals like inclusiveness and social mobility. And I think that's a very important point. And you know, it's great that the conversation has really changed, you know, from perhaps what it was in the late 20th century when, you know, the two things were seen as really enemies of, of, of one another. Wouldn't you agree? No, I totally agree. And I think you're bringing up a very important point, you know, in a sense that the world that we're living in today is very different from the world that we had inherited maybe 25, 30 years ago, you know. And I think what I'm seeing also is a move from from business understanding that their responsibility is not just profit, but there's a greater emphasis now on people and planet as well. And I think this whole area around conscious capitalism is growing in a big way. You know, I think gone are the days where business would only talk about what is the shareholder value? And I think there's now more of an emphasis on how do we create more stakeholder value? Because that stakeholder value is what is going to uh, bring about this fundamental environmental social governance change that we are seeing now. So I think you touched on a really important point that I wanted to, to get to as well, you know, because the traditional way of looking at what companies do, at least from the neoliberal era of the 80s until perhaps quite recently, you know, the dominant paradigm is that companies are all about creating shareholder value. And ultimately, mm. companies are just accountable to their shareholders. Governments are accountable for bigger goals. Mm -hmm. Governments companies but the companies themselves should just be accountable to shareholders should just be profit maximizing uh, machines you know if you like and they don't need to adhere to uh, a bigger vision or, or broader social goals but then in recent times you know you do have much more of a conversation among corporate leaders among fortune 500 leaders you know big companies all over the world that hey you know we are accountable to different constituencies correct and mm -hmm. if you, uh, it's not entirely new i think for example some european countries do have uh, a system where you have a supervisory board on top of the, the the main board of directors, and that supervisory board has workers' representatives, or union representatives, for example. So it's not an entirely new concept. But do you, do you sense that really this this whole conversation around you know what the goals of companies should be is really changing, you know, in a more progressive direction away from this sort of a Gordon Gecko greed is good, share yeah. shareholder value and nothing else. I mean, and what's what's driving that change? I think there are a variety of things that is driving the change. I think firstly, there is a lot of investor, I would say activism in terms of saying, hey, we need to look at things differently in terms of how we want to operate in this new global economy. And this particular global economy is not just focused on profitability, but it's also now starting to look at climate change and how we're managing climate change and the focus on, I would say, adaptation, but also mitigation. Mm. I think that's gonna be an important point that we need to start looking and that, and, and that companies are starting to focus on as well in terms of how are we addressing climate science changes you know, in our own countries. But to answer your question, you know, I think there has been a lot of NGO pressure but also citizen pressure to say, hey, we, we cannot live in, in this kind of world anymore. We have to start thinking differently. Our, our business models need to start to change. The way we think about how we do business needs to change. You know, so I think all of this is driving to a change whereby the focus is more on what is it that we are doing to preserve the planet and the planet resources? But also, how are we working in harmony with, with people and, and society as a whole? You know, so I think you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure that is coming from, from investors. And, and this is seen, I think, in Asia as well, even, even in the US, where um, 
shareholder value is now becoming an important issue as we, as we know, but it's more of the stakeholder in terms of people in your supply chain, for example, or your, your vendors across the supply chain that are putting pressure to say, hey, we want to see this change. Right, right. Yeah, and I think uh, we do see that the consumers are more socially conscious, they're powerful, they can exercise their purchasing power to reward or punish companies right. depending on how progressive they are. And we've seen that kind of uh, socialization happening. And I think also among companies, as uh, I think you were alluding to, I mean, government is a stakeholder and many companies now feel that, hey, I should get ahead of you know, regulations that the government is likely to introduce in the future. I'll be better mm -hmm. prepared for the competition if I start doing some of these things now, rather than wait for the government to, to legislate it with carrots and sticks and so on. So yeah. um, it is certainly a change of the scene in the, in the corporate sector. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we shouldn't undermine the role of social media as well. Social media is playing a huge role in terms of how companies are now perceiving themselves, but also putting pressure on the companies to change their, their practices to more sustainability practices. You know, starting to look specifically at uh, how, how they are reducing their carbon emissions. You know, how are they thinking in terms of scope one, scope two, scope three emissions? What is it that they're looking at uh, conserving water resources, for example? You know, are they thinking long term in terms of looking at uh, reuse and recycle initiatives, for example? But I think there's also a transformative change that is happening around uh, the circular movement or circular thinking in terms of how do we how do we make sure that there's a circular loop in our manufacturing process, for example. So there's less waste, mm -hmm. you know? So I think all of this is moving into, into a new sphere of, of thinking. And I think companies need to start thinking in terms of how they can be more innovative in this particular way. So you touched on, you know, the circular economy, which includes, you know, recycling, uh, and that's one important part of the whole uh, sustainable development goals conversation. But I wanted to ask you, Nitesh, I mean, when we talk about UN sustainable development goals or SDGs, you know, there are presumably, you know, different types of yardsticks out there for doing good or being environmentally safe or sound or conscious. And UN SDGs are one yardstick. I mean, there might be others. I think there's an ISO standard, for example, on you know, environmental uh, compliance. So why, why should companies pay more attention to the SDGs rather than other types of yardsticks that may be out there? And what's so compelling about them? Yeah. So Leon, I think you raise an important point. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, global sustainability standards out there. But for me personally, I think that the UN Sustainable Development Goals has provided us a framework. It's actually provided a, a framework in which we can, we can, we can do better. And when I say do better, I talk about how we can change the way we think from an economic, social, and governance perspective. So what I have found with some of the clients that, I, that I've worked with is that the SDGs have provided a good framework in terms of understanding their sustainability objectives. But looking at that through a lens of environmental, social governance programs and initiatives. And what I have found is that, you know, the UN SDGs is a unifying sustainability plan for the planet because it includes those very fundamental economic issues, those fundamental social issues, but also those environmental issues that I've just talked about when we look at SDG six for water, SDG seven, looking at energy, or SG 13, more importantly, looking at climate change, you know? So for me, it, it forms an embracing sustainability, I would say an embracing sustainability theme where, where companies, organizations, individuals start thinking broadly on that framework. Because what I have found also more interesting working with institutions is that it is not just the framework, but it is also the, the targets 
and the indicators, because those targets and indicators serve as important key performance areas and key performance indicators that institutions can work toward. So, you know, Leon, it's important to say that the SDGs have been, have been developed over a 50 year period. You know, if you really think about when sustainability started in the early 70s, when it was, uh, you know, when the UN had its first uh, conference on uh, human environment in the, in the late 1970s, and then, after, and then after that, we had the MDGs, you know, the Millennium Development Goals. Yes, I do remember right? that. Not so, everyone will be. I remember ex that. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, for me, the SDGs has been a culmination of 50 years of work. And we should respect that, I think, in a sense that it is now bringing, it's, it is now bringing our communities together, it's bringing our people together, it's bringing businesses together. And I think the, uh, the important element for me is that the SDGs is bringing together a common agenda. And, it is, and it is a common agenda that I think that we can work toward. Yes, and uh, happening under the aegis of the UN as well, which is clearly a unifying force that can rise above you know, a lot of the noise and chatter that you hear from uh, you know, different sections of uh, this conversation, I think that's that's important too. And 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 as you remind us, I mean, this has been going on for a long time. So yes. there is uh, a, a history there, and you know those SDGs have been defined in a particular way for for a reason because we've we've gone down this path. And I think you touched on, you know, things like water conservation and energy conservation. It's very multi-dimensional. So th th thanks so much for sharing your thoughts, uh, Nitesh. So. We are kind of running out of time, so we'll be wrapping up this first show, but I think we will be bringing you the next show with uh, Nitesh uh, as well to delve a bit more deeply into what these SDGs are and what companies can do, what you can do you know, as a corporate leader, as a business owner to incorporate these sustainable development goals into your corporate mission and how you can basically do better by doing good so that will be uh coming up in the next edition thank you so much nitesh for joining us uh for today's fire sessions thank you thank you Leon, and uh, all the best to you take care thank you